Hi, this is Jack Dalton again. I'm still in Laos, exploring the enigmatic, as I like to say, Plain of Jars archaeological complex. I'm with my trusty companion. Roz Ho. <laughs> <laughs> and we are now at the third of the sites in this complex that we've explored this morning. This is site number two. Roz, there are actually about 60 more or less sites. Yeah, with about 2,000 to 2,500 jars that have been found in this area. Some of the sites have over 300 jars, like site number one. Some of the sites, as I understand it, just have a single jar. Uh, this site has 93 jars. Site number two has 93 jars. And we have two really great examples here right behind us. One dramatically laying on its side, and you can see the opening. And you can see the lid, you know, the part where the lid is supposed to go, the lip right here. Where a lid might have, a stone lid or a wooden lid might have sat on top of it, secured by that groove or that lip. Um, and behind me, you see a very tall one. Let's see, I'm five feet, four inches tall, and this, therefore, is what, about six feet? Tall? Uh, I think it's more like seven feet tall. Part of it so. may be buried in the ground as well. Roz, as you know, the, the tallest of these jars were up to three meters, so over nine feet tall, and up to about three meters in di uh, three meters in diameter. That's true. So some of these are very tall and broad as well. And thus very heavy. Yeah, that, that's why they're called megalithic from the Latin uh, mega meaning large and lithic meaning stone. And the Plain of Jars uh, is one of the uh, greatest megalithic sites in the world. I mean, there are other megalithic sites, of course. We've been to Stonehenge. Yeah, and just East, to uh, Easter Island as yeah, well. Yeah, just to put it a little bit in context, these jars are probably about 2,000 years old, and we don't really know a lot about the culture that made these jars or a lot about what their functional purposes are. Yeah, there are a lot of mysteries surrounding the jars. Who made them? exactly when they were made, what they were made for, how they were transported from the quarries to this to these sites. For Especially example, something this big. Yeah, this is monumental. I mean, the largest uh, of these jars weighs over 10 tons. Um, and they were quarried locally, but not right at this site. For example, this site, site number two, is at the top of a small mountain. So what little archaeology that have been done on these sites uh, tells us that these were probably used for burials uh, containing, they have found cremated human remains within some of these jars. Um, the first excavation, I believe, was done in the 1930s. Yeah, a French archaeologist, Madeleine Colani, did the first work here in the 1930s, uh, and she found inside many of the urns cremation remains, burnt bones. And uh, other, uh, other objects were probably grave goods, small beads made out of uh, semi-precious stones, for example. And uh, there were tools and other bones scattered in the ground around the jars as well. And, and as well as uh, secondary burials with uncremated human remains. So they don't really know why some human remains were cremated inside a jar and some were buried apparently in the grounds around it. Yeah, let's be clear. The cremations did not take place in the jars. There is a cave at site number one, which is believed to have been a crematorium. Uh, it has holes in the roof of the cave, cave to allow the smoke to be released. The jars were vessels in which they put the cremated remains, the human remains after they had been burnt. So it would have been ash and bits of bone and teeth. And they found teeth in these jars as well. Well, since the 1930s, there's been some archaeological work, I believe, in the 1990s. And 2000s. And 2000s, uh, where archaeologists are continuing to try to unravel the mystery of the culture that built these jars. Yeah, there's been a lot of work, especially in the 2000s, uh, in connection with UNESCO, so that these sites might be given the protection or the honor of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I think they've been listed as, as nominated to be placed on the World Heritage Site list. I think it's quite likely that we'll become a World Heritage Site. Yeah, I think it's been listed since 2009. It certainly should be a World Heritage Site because it is just an extraordinarily impressive site. Um, mysterious, romantic, enigmatic. Yeah, I just just to kind of set some things in, sorry to interrupt. No, please go ahead, Set Roz. some more things in context. The reason why so little archaeology has been done around it is because during 
the Vietnam War from about 1964 to 1973, uh, this area was heavily bombed. In fact, around some of the sites, you could see the bomb craters. Yeah, there's a lot of unexploded ordnance in beneath the ground here, so it's very, very, a very dangerous area. In fact, it's been called the most dangerous archaeological site in the world. You have to stay within carefully demarcated zones because it's only within those zones that the area has been has been cleared of unexploded ordnance uh, below the ground. You know, I I said, Roz, that we're at the top of a small mountain here, and that may seem inconsistent with the with the uh, name Plain of Jars. But actually, most of the jars are not on the high plateau um, the, 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 from which the plain of jars takes its name. Most of the jars are actually on the periphery of the plateau, on the slopes of the mountains that ring this part of Laos, which is near the city of Ponsavon, in uh, nor sort of northern central Laos on the eastern side near Vietnam. It's about 270 kilometers from the Mekong or Luang Prabang. Yeah, and it took us about six and a half hours to drive here yesterday. Yeah, it was. So it's, it was a, it's a long journey, which is why the site is actually not as uh, visited as some of the other archaeological sites in the Southeast Asia area. Yeah, I mean, I've said it again and again and again, but we are the only tourists at this site today, and it's such a privilege and pleasure to be here. Yeah, personally, I find it very, very, um, you know, enjoyable to be here all by ourselves in around you know surrounded by these mysterious stones it's a very serene atmosphere today for and that's so appropriate for this is actually an ancient cemetery right and so with that i think we'll we'll move on Roz. this afternoon as i understand it we're going to visit some uh some villages of the local ethnic groups and uh most significantly the Hmong people and today is uh, they're celebrating their New Year's. Right. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay, right. Roz. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.